All right, kids, we are doing this again. I still don't have any more pictures up. I still am lighting this solely with the window. It might be bad, we'll see. So, these are all of the myths, assumptions, and questions y'all left for me on my Instagram. This video is probably gonna be a little longer than I usually do, but I wanna make sure that I can answer all your questions. If you're new here, hi, my name is Sydney. I am autistic, disabled, gay, and a musician. So it's Autism Pride Month, and so we're gonna do some autism myths, assumptions, and questions. What are some things you wish neurotypical people knew about autistic people? I wish people knew that it isn't a compliment to say I didn't notice you were autistic. I wish people didn't treat me like a toddler when I'm stimming or flapping or, or speaking um, stuttery, like when I go semi-verbal. And I wish people were just more accepting and understanding of all things and more okay with it. And I know that there's just so much stigma around autism, but the problem is that we're trying to break down that stigma, but because of the stigma, people are refusing to listen to us. So there is a divide and that's really frustrating. I don't really know if that answered the question, but that's what I have to say about that. Do you consider your autism to be a disability? Okay. Yes and no. No, because when I'm in a situation where it's all neurodiverse people, it's not a disability. It's, it's just who we are and it's not a problem at all. That being said, disabled isn't a bad word and there's a lot of movement about saying autism isn't a disability because it, it isn't, but almost all disabilities are disabling because of society. Like autism is disabling because society isn't kind to us. But pretty much every other disability is that way too. If you're in an accessible space, it's fine and you don't notice it. Um, and so I'm still not used to calling autism a disability. Like I, I, in my head, my disabled parts of me are my chronic illness pieces and my memory loss pieces and my autism is a different part of me, like in my brain. But that being said, I think, I mean, if we want disability rights, we have to all work together and by saying that autism isn't a disability but also disabled isn't a bad word it kind of contradicts itself it's kind of sticky but i've been thinking about this a lot recently actually i'm also autistic hi i'd love to know how you deal with those who are ignorant i mean i try to be as kind and educational as i can and if they don't understand the terminology I'm using, I'll just explain it in a different way. For example, especially because of stigma, if I say I have a hard time understanding this, or if you could explain it to me this way, I would appreciate it, they're more than happy to accommodate unless they're the kind of person that isn't. And for people who aren't, who aren't accepting, who aren't accommodating, I really just try to be as kind as I can and just accept that I'm not gonna get anywhere and not spend too much energy trying to force it because autistic people are very likely to feel strongly about things being fair and so when somebody says something that's wrong or unaccepting it can be really upsetting to us and I think there comes a point where I always try to educate, I always try to be kind, and I always try to give people the benefit of the doubt to learn and to be willing to learn. That being said, some people are not willing to learn and have rigid thinking patterns and that's just a part of who they are and there's gonna come a point where the person on the other side isn't going to be willing to learn and you're just gonna keep expending energy trying to make it so that they'll learn but they're not gonna make that difference. So I let give people the opportunity to learn. If they wanna learn, we continue that conversation. If they don't wanna learn, I don't push it because it's not worth my time and energy and I do my education this way instead and hope that maybe someday it gets around to them. Any advice for finding good bras, pants, etc. that are good for those with sensory issues? Well, if you want to see my entire closet, I have a video about it. It's just right over here. I don't wear pants, so can't tell you about that one. The only pants I wear are pajama pants and I get my pajamas from Kohl's. They have pajama sets that are really soft and really nice. Um, the Croft and Barrow. I think is, is the brand that I usually get from. All my clothes are very sensory friendly because most of them are handmade or sustainably made vintage pieces, which again, watch this video and you can learn about my whole closet. But I did not cover socks or underclothes in that one. So socks, I usually get mine from Target. I'm always wearing socks, just like constantly. I can't have bare feet. I'll show you my socks. I have hippos on them today. Yeah, it's a hippo with a little bird on its head. Um, they're from Target, so that's usually the socks that I go for. Um, and then in regards to bras, I've struggled with this one a lot as well. Soma, very comfortable. They don't have underwire. They stay up. They're really soft. Those are my favorite. I mean, they're expensive, but all bras are expensive because society. Uh, what are some of your favorite coping strategies when the world gets overwhelming? I've gotten a lot more comfortable openly flapping, openly stimming. Like if I'm stressed or something, when I'm like walking outside on the green or something, I will just go like this and I'm, I'm okay with that now. 
I'm a lot less nervous about it than I used to be, which is a big, big change for me. I have lots of playlists for every single different mood because I'm a musician, but I also keep myself grounded by listening to music. So I'm listening to music almost constantly when I'm not trying to like read something. <laughs> um, so definitely that. I have lots and lots of playlists for different moods. I have, there's one playlist I have that I have six different versions of it. That's that's how I, I tend to cope with things. I've also gotten in the habit because I'm having all my classes on Zoom, like right there, and I'm sitting next to my bed. I've gotten in the habit of just like holding a teddy bear on my lap during class because nobody can tell and it doesn't matter. And I'm a huge fan of that. And then of course, my very favorite coping strategy is dogs because I love animals and they calm me down a whole lot. So that's that. Advice for an adult who thinks she's autistic but doesn't know how to get diagnosed. Awesome, okay, don't know how. Um, that's true. It's really, things are vague and they're hard to find. So you're going to look up neuropsych testing near you. Um, there's lots of different groups that do it. I just want to warn you that it can be expensive. Um, it's usually expensive and insurance does cover it, but I don't know if it covers all of it. I'm not quite sure my parents dealt with that. I did not. So I cannot say that specifically. If you look up neuropsych testing in your area, you can probably find it and you can go to them. If you're concerned and you want an autism diagnosis specifically, so some places just do ADHD or just autism and some places do both in link. If you don't present like a typical teenage boy who likes trains, it might be a good idea in your appointment to say, hi, I think I'm autistic, here's the reasons why, because then they'll actually know to look for it. And if they don't know, they might miss it. Also know that self-diagnosis is really valid. You're totally valid if you're self-diagnosed because the diagnosis is so gatekept. Um, so if a diagnosis means something to you and it means that you can get accommodations that you need, absolutely go for it, but it's also not a must have, if that makes sense. I'm in the process of being diagnosed and I'm scared that they will dismiss me, but when I read other autistic experiences, it makes so much sense to me. I understand this very much. I was nervous about this the first time and I did not come at it with a diagnosis. If you want to see my diagnosis story, it's over here. Well, I think if you're just open and say, I think I'm autistic and here's the reasons I am. And by the way that this is phrased, it makes it seem like you're not quite sure. But if you're reading a bunch of autistic experiences and they all make sense to you and they all feel like that's your reality and that's the life that you're living, then that's your reality and that's the life that you're living. And if a doctor doesn't quite know what to look for and then they tell you you're not autistic because they only have been taught the stereotype of it, it doesn't mean that you're not autistic. It just means that that specific doctor hasn't seen autism like you before. So you're valid. Also, as I mentioned earlier, self-diagnosis is again, perfectly valid, but if it means something to you, if it means you can get more accommodations, do seek it. Um, but just be very open with them and say, I think I'm autistic. Here's the reasons why. Can you help me get a diagnosis? Here's why I need one. I've met some doctors that aren't very helpful and I've met some that really, really are. So it, it just depends. So if, if the one place you go to says you're not, that doesn't mean that you're not. It just means that's not the right doctor for you. And that's totally okay. How did you accommodate yourself before you had a diagnosis, but after you figured out that you were autistic? Frankly, I didn't accommodate myself after I was diagnosed either. Like it's really a recent thing. Um, <laughs> after I was autistic, but before I was officially diagnosed, I was scared because I didn't understand that self-diagnosis is valid in the community. And I didn't think that I had a right to read the books or take up space as an autistic person until I had an official clinical diagnosis. That's not the case. Goodness if I could tell little Sydney that, Ugh. but I didn't look into it. So I only knew the autism from Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. And I went, that's me. And that was it. I didn't do any more research. I didn't think any more through it than that until I was a senior in high school. No, I was a junior and we read extremely loud and incredibly close. And then I was like, okay, this is getting weird. I'm definitely, I definitely am. And then I started doing a little more research in it. But because of that, I didn't really accommodate myself. I didn't let myself stim. I didn't think, oh, maybe I do have over empathy and here's how I can cope with it. I was more trying to tackle the migraines and tackle the anxiety and tackle the depression and, and tackle all these things separately as their own separate beings. And I didn't understand that everything was intertwined under one umbrella of autism. And once I got my diagnosis, still had a hard time getting all those things, all those pieces to fit together because I just didn't know what was happening. To be fair, I was quite ill. You can watch the story of that one over here. But definitely over quarantine, because I've had less time to socialize with people, I've been able to take more time to understand myself and reflect within myself and learn how I cope and learn how I deal with things. 
and understand every single piece of my brain and my body and how things work and I've been able to understand the connections between all the things. For example, I can now tell the difference between a dehydration migraine and a hunger migraine and a sleep migraine, which I could never do before. Um, also an anxiety migraine, I can usually stop those now. So my migraines are significantly less than they used to be because I'm now being able to cope with my anxiety because I've taught myself how to do that with an autistic lens. And that's really recent. So I don't think I answered your question the answer is I kind of didn't. I kind of didn't accommodate myself. I just was like, huh, I'm different. And then I just kind of left it at that and just let myself flounder. What I wish that I did is understood that self-diagnosis is valid and done the research and figured out how autistic people cope with the world and how they handle the world. And I would have actually used those skills earlier in life, but I didn't. And that's okay. I'm cool with where I am. I'm happy where I am now. I'm, I'm having a good old time where I am in life now, but I also, things would have been easier for me if I had made those decisions earlier, but that's okay. I'm doing my job now to help you to do that so that you don't make the same mistakes I did. That's why we're here. What are some of your past and present special interests? I have a video about that over here as well. For those of you who don't know what a special interest is, it's like more or less an obsession. Obsession has a connotation, but it's an obsession without the connotation. It's something that we are really, really passionate about. We learn everything about. Um, so I can't think of the specific list right now, but um, some general ones are music, psychology, Disney. I love Disney. I love Disney history. I love princess history, fashion history. Um, those all kind of line up. If you notice, I dress historically, but I also dress princess because those two things line up and there's a psychological reason behind why people find that aesthetic specifically attractive, which we're going to talk about at some point. I love it. I also love the psychology of revolutions. Specifically, the Russian Revolution is my favorite revolution of all of them. Um, I mean, it's not my favorite, like I don't like war, but <laughs> I think it's fascinating. I, I think Russian history is very fascinating. Those are kind of my big ones, I think. Oh, I love linguistics and languages. How did I forget that? I love linguistics and lang languages. I learned them a lot. Is it true that you can't understand sarcasm or metaphors slash autistic people lack a sense of humor? No. I mean, yes, but no. Um, we have our own humor. We find our own things funny. We're not called unfeeling robots. I cannot understand sarcasm unless, sometimes I can. With certain people, I can understand their sarcasm if I know them quite well, or if like it's obvious within the situation that they have to be joking because it's, it's the only way that what they're saying can make sense. Or if they're really obvious like, oh, I just love that. Like I can tell that that's sarcastic. It's when somebody's being sarcastic in a mean way that I can't totally understand. Or like, I, there's a lot of times I miss the joke and I get confused, but within the autistic community, it's fine because I understand everybody. So it's just a neurotypical problem. That's all I have to say about that. Do you have any food slash eating aversions? If so, how did you slash do you work through those? Yes, I have a lot of, I've always been a really picky eater since I was little. That's just like a thing. Um, but then I, got really sick last spring, which again, watch the video. Um, I got shut down and so I had to go on the FODMAP diet, which is a completely allergen free diet and I had to slowly add foods back. Um, so I have a bunch of allergies now. So not only am I a picky eater, but I also can't have soy, garlic, onions, caffeine, but that's not like in things or lactose, but I take a pill for that when I do want to eat it. So that's a situation. Generally, I've found it's important to try new foods and it's really important to do that but also when i don't have the energy to try new food and i try new food it will literally just make my body decide not to eat and so i'll try to eat the thing and my whole body will get the shakes and i won't be able to eat so i've been trying to balance trying new things and branching out versus existing and letting myself eat because i need to eat to like survive um at college because i have so many allergens I've literally just been having plain chicken, rice, and a vegetable for almost every single one of my meals since I've gotten here, which hasn't bothered me. I currently am getting around that by eating the same thing for every single meal. Um, in the future, I, I don't mind trying new things, but I think I need to try new things within, like I'm not gonna try all new things in a meal. I'm gonna say, okay, instead of having 
chicken and rice and a vegetable. I'm gonna have chicken and rice and a new vegetable that I've never had before. I'll just, just change one of those three things so I still have something else to fall back on if it doesn't work. And I think having other options available just in case and not having any shame behind not liking a food is also really helpful for me. I've heard that autistic people don't have empathy. Is that true? No, some people don't, but it's kind of sketchy. More or less, we probably all have hyper empathy, which means we feel too much. Sometimes we show, we care so much that we shut down and so it doesn't look like we have any empathy. But like if, if I drop a teddy bear on the floor, I will feel bad and I'll apologize to it. It's a whole thing. If you want to learn more about autism and empathy, you can check out this video. What's hyper focus like? Zoom. It's like zoom, 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 zoomy. That's a terrible explanation, but it's just like very zoomy. It's kind of like, I'm, I think other people, it's the thing called flow. They talk about it in psychology, which means that other people get it too, I think. When you sit down and you're doing something that's just the perfect level of challenge, but it's also the perfect level of easy for you, and you just get into a zone and you just keep going. It's like that, but it can last for days. And it's kind of awesome because you just feel like you have so much energy and so much productivity in you and so much ability to do everything. And it's so good. It also means that we often forget that we have limits and need to eat food and need to like pee and whatever, but it's good. It's very good. It's a good time. So please hyper-focus responsibly. After years of masking around others and myself, it's hard to not. Any tips? gonna be a little silly. The way that I learned to not mask was I literally just forced myself to be a stereotype. And I did. And I flapped and I didn't make any eye contact. And I mean, this is that's what I did during my autism, uh, during my, mm, what's the word? During my doctor's appointment because I wanted to get diagnosed. And so I was like, I'm gonna be a stereotype so I have to get diagnosed. And I did get diagnosed. And then I was like, wait, all those pieces I did were kind of fun and they were good coping mechanisms for me. And I think it's about getting comfortable doing it with yourself, being alone with yourself and doing those things. Once I got comfortable with flapping on my own and looking at myself in the mirror, flapping my hands, then I felt comfortable doing it around other people. Once I felt comfortable just sitting in my room and when I got happy at something, just going, hmm, hmm, like that means that I would get more comfortable being able to do that in public. And I think it starts with accepting it yourself and understanding it yourself. Um, masking in social situations, it's really hard to undo. I started by saying, okay, here's a list of all the things that I wanna be as a person. These are all the lists of the things that I've been hiding about myself or actions or ways I speak that I've been hiding that I wanna bring back. And then I would go into social interaction with those like top five things in mind and then I would make sure to do more of more of that so that kind of helped me I mean I still mask in situations by accident and I'm still learning and I'm still dealing with it but that's my general advice on that can you explain why non-speaking is preferred over non-verbal I've not actually heard that this is a thing but I don't know nobody really likes either word because they both kind of have a connotation to them and we don't quite know how to feel about it so if you have a better word, nobody does, but if there should be a better word is what, what I'm coming down to. If you want to learn more about AAC and all the terms that we use and whatever, um, any literature slash information for parents of newly diagnosed autistic children? Yes, I have a resource guide, which is this video. It's also on my website and I will include it below. And then I also made a guide specifically for parents of autistic children, which is on my website. Obviously I'm not an expert, I'm not a parent, but I have worked with a lot of kids and that's kind of a guide of what I wish people did for me. And just, it's it's all the things that I wish other people knew about autism, that I wish I knew about autism when I'm working with autistic kids. So I'll include a link to that and you can check that out. I hope that that's helpful. I've heard that autistic people can't lie. Is that true? Yes, it's completely true. Autistic people are incapable of telling lies. <laughs> No, we, we can we can lie. Um, people do. I don't, because ethically, I don't like lying. But I'm, I'm sure that people do lie. Generally, people assume this because A, we're really bad at hiding things. Because our facial expressions are different from the neurotypical norm, they, they look a little different. And so people can tell when they're lying, typically. Also because a lot of us have a really strong opinion of right and wrong, and we just think that lying is wrong and we don't want to do the wrong thing. At the same time, sometimes you're supposed to tell white lies, but like, when do you do that? Like, when do you tell that friend that they shouldn't get the haircut that they want to get because it'll look really terrible? Like, I don't know. So I just believe in being honest all the time, personally. 
Also, we have a hard time understanding what other people are saying to begin with. So if you're hiding a meaning behind it, that's just illogical and it's not fair and we're very big on trust. And so that's why we don't, I say we, I mean me. In general, all the autistic people that I know don't like to lie and they don't like to tell lies. Um, so that's my opinion and experience of that. And our last question, are there any factions in the autistic community? Does presentation affect social structures? Whoa, that's a loaded question. Please, autistic people, tell me your opinions on this. I think that there is a bit of a social structure. I mean, we like to be as inclusive and kind as we can, but there is definitely a thing which is Aspie supremacy. Um, people who are diagnosed with Asperger's, it doesn't exist in our country. It doesn't exist in the US anymore. It does exist in a lot of other countries because it's still in the ICD. Um, if you want to learn more about functioning labels, check it out. Some people may feel superior over other people because they're like, I'm more high functioning and so I can have better conversations or I can pass. Um, and so those things do exist, but I think in general, in my experience, it's been a very accepting community. And I think if somebody is being unaccepting of another autistic person, the other person will call them out on it. Like we're really <laughs> the kind of people that just like call people out and say, well, that's not a nice thing to do. Or this makes me feel weird, especially with each other. We don't really hold back. So I think, yes, those things do exist, but we're trying to have them not exist, if that makes any sense. Yeah, those were all your questions. Thank you for asking them. I had a lot of fun today. I hope you learned something. I hope you had fun. I'll do another one of these at some point if you want me to. I don't know, let me know. And yeah, I hope you have a really nice day and I'll see you in the next one.